All right, we were in John chapter 3, and I did, uh, we might have to make this one a little shorter since we made the last one a little longer. I really don't want to keep everybody real late or whatever. Um, we did have a couple of hands up, and I don't know if anybody's comments are still wanting, anybody wants to still comment? Ricky? Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, Amen. We have the the uh the uh the uh the the Are you asking a question? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you have a comment? Okay. Kelly, did you have one? Mm hmm Yes. Well, you know, if everything I said in the last class could be remembered in relationship to the first semester about, and if, you know, a little further on down here, in the, well, actually, I think it's in the fourth chapter, maybe it's in the end of the third, um, you know, John says this, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthy. And he starts going into this thing, and it begins to go back to this deal of the, of the Father and the Logos, and... I don't think, I think that we hear teaching on this and then we forget and we go back to our old concepts of Jesus, that he is Jesus of Nazareth, the guy that came 2,000 years ago and he did something on the cross and through that, that's helped me and that's the Jesus we know. We're not really aware of the Jesus that the Father knows that is seated at his right hand, exalted by the Father. It's a big difference. I mean, that's the Jesus that is. We're still knowing, you know, I use the terminology of historical Jesus, but let's just be real plain with it. We're still knowing a theological Jesus that somewhere we came up, or somebody taught us or said something about this Jesus, and we can't seem to shake it. And one, re the, you know, the only real way to shake that is to have your mind renewed. And the mind doesn't get renewed by, you know, half-hearted fooling around. I mean, it just doesn't. It just never will. It'll take forever if you do. But the truth is, the very spirit and nature of that is compromise and half-heartedness. So if you do compromise and half-heartedness forever, God can never, any juncture, reward that or... You, do you understand what I mean? And if he does, and this is what I've seen, and I've seen it true in me, and whatever, if he does reward, or if I perceive it as some sort of reward then I will pervert it because I'm not really online with God I'm not really of the right spirit I'm not really after God and so any miracle he works through me or gives to me is going to be is going to be badly perverted because I'm already perverted if you understand what I mean or, or, or it's going to be badly compromised because I'm already compromised uh huh Last Adam. Giving spirit. Yes. Amen. I didn't mean to correct you there, but that's a big difference there between the uh, second Adam and the last Adam. <coughs> uh huh.
I think it's cool too, the prodigal son didn't really understand sonship. But once he got into the crisis of the hog pen, he began to understand fatherhood or the father. And he began to think, but he didn't know sonship yet at all. Because he didn't know sonship, that's why he went out and spent all... That's why you'd even leave the father in the first place. You know. And he didn't know it. So he goes off. But in the hog pen, when he's lost all, no sense realm input, no... You know what I mean? No good life, nothing to comfort your flesh and, you know, to put you in a state of want where you realize, I need some help. You know, people wonder why God lets people get to that degree... And I'll tell you why, out of his mercy. <laughs> but anyway, but he remembers some things about his father, what his father was like, that his father is a provider. I, there's no, I, I'm sitting here eating hog food, but even the servants in my father's house eat better than this, which spoke of the father as a provider and is not just a provider for his own children, but apparently a pretty good provider in relationship to his servants. He sure got better than what he's got over here in this country. And he began to think in terms of that, in the terms of the, what he had in the Father's house, which is based on the Father's presence. Okay? So then as he began to return to the Father, he found himself as a son, or in sonship because sonship is absolutely useless and a total stupid doctrine without knowing the Father. Totally stupid without the Father, you know. So anytime you hear anybody talking about sonship and they don't mention the Father or the Son in whom your sonship is valid, then it's, you know, they're off on some wild something or other. But, but then, but then, he, I mean, he began to actually realize his sonship when he got back to the father and he said, you know, father, I want to tell you my viewpoint of the whole thing and some of it was valid based on the old. I'm not worthy. And, and you know, until a, person is, until a person has come to the I am not worthy, you are not ever going to know the treasure of Christ. You'll never... Or if you know it, you'll never appreciate it because it won't be treasure to you. He'll be, he'll be good stuff or he'll be helpful or I remember the time, but he'll never be treasure. Treasure. Until, until you realize anything I have to offer, all my ability, all my is useless apart from Christ. And you just come back like, like he did. And he says, I am not. I am not worthy. I am not. Huh? Roger? Yes. That's right. And because there was no, you know, he'd been put in a place where it was, it was a tough situation. And, and you know what is bad? Many times we get put in a place that is a tough situation and instead of going to the Father and finding out about sonship and building a relationship built on Christ and the Father, I mean uh, the Son and the Father, and entering into that, we have fellowship and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son entering into that. We cry out in the hog pen and throw such a fit and get into such a panic like a catfish on a trot line that's rolling and flailing and trying to get off that he comes and he lets us out he, he, he lets us off the hook but we've never learned anything and we haven't made any progress towards this but we glorify the deliverance And that's when he learned it when he came back. Absolutely. And isn't that cool? Because you're right. I mean, we can know those things, but unless we come back to the Father, we'll never know what he's really like, even when we're the yuckiest. You know. 
Right. But one thing you have to realize is that, is that the sun went out. That's what it says. He got, he said, give me, give me, there you go, give me, give me the things, the inheritance that falls to me. That's what he said. Give me the things that fall to me. And he went out from the Father. Okay. That action right there will bring... That, that action is based on self, that's based on pride, that's based on uh, wanting your way. And you, okay, so here's the path that he's on. This is not God's path. This is not God's path. And God didn't push him out and go, you know, you're sitting here in the home and you ain't learning nothing. Get on this yucky path. He chose that and he needed to learn that his cho choosing, his ways, his thoughts were not you know, but he didn't just see. We always look at the hog pen and say, but really, the selfishness, the the pride, the, all of that. This is the manifestation of all of that. Well, the the desire of the father would be that everybody understand that. Now, I don't know that. You know, I don't know. I don't know that everybody has to come to that. I, you know, I really don't know. I, I, I think that they probably have to just because you can't get into Romans. You, you, you can hear the truths of Romans 6 and the truths of Romans 8, but you can't get there except through Romans 7. And I believe that. Just, well, you can't get out of Egypt directly into the land. And what was the, you know, the primary thing in the land was uh, the giving of the law. The giving of the law. And the purpose of the law. And that is usually, I mean, most of us take that road, or, or especially those that will come this route and then come back. They've been this road. They will apply the law to themselves. They'll try to become righteous, they'll try to become everything God wants, they'll try to obey all the scriptures and all the commandments and everything only to find that the harder they try, the worse they are because the revelation that's needed at that point isn't how good God is, but how bad we are. So that and, and, and it's not like I'm going to bring you to a place where you're bad and then you're going to see you're bad it's like I'm going to bring you to a place to see what you always were and you were before you got saved, actually. But you're still that way. I mean, I'm, I'm writing some things right now, actually, in, rela in, in the deal of this. And I, you know, I said, you know, Israel, once they got out in the wilderness, they continued to act and think and everything the way they were in Egypt. But though they were taken out of that place, place, in Adam, now in Christ, though they were taken out of that place, they had to get it out of them. You know, you can take somebody out of Egypt, but you've got to get Egypt out of them. And so, um, you know, the father was aware of what was in his son, but the son went out, and through his actions, and it's, an, it's automatic. I mean, you know, the, the swine is turned to his mire, the dog to his own vomit. But it's what happens here that makes all the difference in the world because I've seen, I believe I've seen God bring people to that point right there, and I believe I've seen them either start, like I said, flailing like a catfish that wants off and God finally lets them off because they are not even looking in any other direction other than the way I believe God to be is my deliverer. And, um, uh, or maybe they just go, well, why did God allow all this when they chose it? 
Why did God allow all this to happen? And I hate God. And then they just leave and they become reprobate. Yeah, it makes sense. Kind of like conning God or something. I mean, if that's as bad as it gets, brother, you're a pretty good guy. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I, I started to say, man, my Roman said was a lot worse than that. <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am. I conned God. <clears throat> Or tried. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, we say, you know, why is why you know, we get to the hog pen and we say, well, what is, why is God allowing all this? Why is God doing all this? What, what is he trying to teach me? And in reality, if you really look at it, uh, he, he ain't trying to teach you nothing. You did this and this and this and it all leads to this and now you've got yourself in this big mess and it's, you know, and we're going, why did you do, he didn't do nothing. He just sat there and watched you, you know, and he's not going to cross your will because he gave you free will and you never looked to him or asked about anything along the way and so you've totally ruined your life and then we go, what are you trying to teach me in this? And I, I mean, I, there's things always to be learned. I mean, the Father is good and wise and so much, but, but, in, but in one sense, he's not trying to teach you anything by that. That's a, that's a bed of your own making. You know, and you know, well, I won't say that, but it's, you know, that is the result of our own stuff. Now, the truth is, there are things to be learned. Uh, one is, um, when I would do good, I don't. You know what I mean? When I would go forward, I go back. Uh, when I, and then the thing to learn from that is, I see then it seems to be a law working in me that when I want to do good, I end up over here doing bad. Then your eyes begin to be open to the reality of an old nature of, or, or the law of that nature, which is the law of sin and death that is in your members, that you will forever and ever and ever, as long as that law is the law of your life or the law operating in you or the government of you, that it will lead to death. It will always lead to that. It will always go the opposite, of ultimately, of what God wants. And so you end up over here. Okay, well, that's half the revelation. That's what Romans... That's the revelation Romans 7, period, is about. Oh, wretched man that I am. Okay? Because once you come to that place, and if you really come to that place, because I've had so many... I mean, I, you cannot imagine. 25 years, I've had so many people say, Oh, I'm there now. You know, in fact, I guess I remember more me saying that. You know, because I, 
kept going through this thing. I mean, I really wanted to know the Lord, and I really did not want the law of sin and death in control of my life. And I thought, you know, I would like think I'm in the ultimate hog pen and go, oh, I'm there now. I know I am God. Now just kind of like, now just show me. Uh, this is it. This is Romans 7. Now just show me Romans 8. And only to find out that uh, there was deeper depths that I had not even imagined and by the patience of God because see if I if he let's say that let's, I mean just I'm going to fake this a little bit but let's say there's a there's a little hog in here a little bigger one here and a bigger one here a little bit bigger one here bigger one here and then the one that God can use that doesn't lead back for everybody but God can use that to lead you back to the Father Okay, so let's say that we come to this first little hog pen and we found ourselves sitting, you know, and da 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 And we're going, oh, you know, this is it. Now, God in his mercy would not reveal his son and reveal the cross and reveal his fatherhood and bring you into that if there's this much depth of, yeah, in you. Uh, because you'll get back in here in the kingdom and you'll just mess everything up. You'll release all this junk. And he knows that. And so God in his mercy, you know, says no, you know, and we're, and I know what I'm talking about because I, this is probably a good example of what I went through. I mean, I cried out. And I went, oh, God, because somehow, because I had studied, I knew the truth, see. And we think because we know that not the truth is, that is the Lord, but the truth of go to the hog pen, cry out, and come back. We think because I know that fact, that once I get in a really bad situation, that's the hog pen, I'll cry out and he'll bring me back. Okay, well, I didn't know the truth of the truth of that situation. I just knew that that was a truth and this must be the hog pen and I'm ready to come back and really be Jesus from now on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Really be a force for God. Well, he said no. You know, well, actually, I don't even know that he said no. I don't know. All I remember is that the veil didn't seem to be rent. That's the only way I know how to put it because I was looking for the veil to be rent and that's the only way I can put it. I don't know how to describe it, but I know what I was looking for. I was looking for the veil to be rent, me see Jesus, and then get on with this thing for God, you know? Well, then I found myself in a bigger one and I'm going, this has got to be it, man. Come on, Lord, I'm ready. I'm running back to you, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And he's, and, and, and the Father doesn't, meet me and kiss me and you know because he knows that if he runs and meets me and kisses me and puts the ring on and everything that there's going to be some of this stuff still left in me that kind of goes yeah well you know I really deserve this ring and this robe and you know I mean because I figured out that once you get to the hog pen you turn to God and so something that I have done I don't know I'm just telling you the truth of what I think you know and it may not be your experience but but I kind of went through this kind of deal, and, 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 I, and so, so then I got like about to the third one, and I realized kind of what he was doing, and I went, man, Father, I don't even want to be coming back early if you hadn't cleared all of the junk out. I don't even want to do that. Man, I don't want to do that. Because I, I if you do, then you'll put me in a position, then I'll taint that, and I'll mess this up, and I'll mess these people up, and I'll take hold of things that I shouldn't be taking hold of and I'll pervert it and you know that slimy you know what I mean that slimy hand thing that touches the things of God and I just go I don't I don't want to do okay okay now I'm ready to work with you now because I would get to this one this one and this one and cry out and go come on come on work with me now by the time I got to this one I'm going I'm ready to work with you so I'm going with him and I'm seeking, and, and now I'm just seeking because I know I need him, and he shows me more depths, more depths, and I don't know the depths of the fallen nature. And, and when I say that, I don't know, you know, maybe he could work in somebody, and they could get to here, and they could, like, right here, just totally fall down and go, I, oh, wretched, you know what I mean? And really, from their heart, not have to see huge, vast depths, but really understand somehow that it's just, there is just 
You know, I will never, ever think that I'm worth anything or I can do it or I'm, oh, I'm smart enough. I will just not do that and not have to really, really see the debt because you're never going to trust in that anymore. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's the case, but I would think that that could be the case because he's not, the goal isn't for you to see as much slime as you can see. The goal is to get you to a place where you go, oh, wretched man that I am. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, is no good thing. Those aren't words. It is a conviction that is so powerful the way I always used it. And once again, it's just another word picture. Don't mean nothing to you. It means everything to me. Is like the Holy Spirit took a brand of that reality and he burned it in my consciousness, not and almost my subconsciousness, because it so works that I... You know, it's what the feel that I get is that thing of Jacob's hip being out. And my walk has changed since I've known that. And I just, I approach everything. I don't go, yeah, hey, get out of the way. Let me just, you know what I mean? I'll, I'll pick that up, you know what I mean? And Jacob's hips, I go, I don't know, man. I mean, I, I want to help as much as I can. But I tell you what, I'm flaky. And I probably fall over trying to do this. But I know what my, you know, your spirit has changed. And by Christ, the nature... You go, I want to help. But by everything that is you, you go, but I really doubt, seriously, I'm going to be much help, but if you'll just let me pitch in, I'll do all that I can. Do you see the difference? One is his nature that says, I want to help. The other one is a real strong, one is, one is Romans 8, where you have entered in. The other one is Romans 7, where you have come to a reality that is, so branded in you, that you just go, look, man, hey, I'm not fool. You know, and people come up and go, oh, man, what a man of God. And you're going, you know, you may be fooled. I ain't fooled. Okay? You know what I mean? I mean, I don't care what you think. I don't care if everybody thinks that. Guess what? I desperately need Jesus. Not just save me, save me healing, this or that. Man, every thought, every, because I, I have to make decisions all the time. Every attitude, you release attitudes all the time over a million things a day. Oh my God, if that be the case, I need Jesus. That's just one day. I need Jesus. That's still part of the same day in other areas. That's, I mean, we're just, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you realize, hey man, this ain't no saved from heaven hell thing anymore. This ain't no what will my ministry be. This is my God. Jesus is the answer and I've got no hope in me. And I mean, you know, I, I love those words. No hope. When I look at me. I used to fear those words. And just before I got to that full reality of no hope, I was scared and I mean scared scared to death. And I'll tell you why. Because I was that far away from no hope and really that brand being applied and I saw my God in just a few more links on this chain I'm going to be no hope and the only conclusion because I hadn't seen the Lord the only conclusion I could come to was I am going to fail God, I'm going to leave God, or I will, I don't know, you know what I mean? I didn't know, I just, all I knew was darkness. That's what it meant to me. It meant failure, failing God. And I can tell you that everything within me did not want to fail God. I did not. I love God. I think I knew that I had found someone that I loved supremely above anything that I had ever loved before and I did not in my one and a half or whatever short year of following Jesus want to not just fail in some little circumstance I mean come to a place of recognition that there is no hope and that I have, I'm a failure to to the one that I love. I have failed God. I did not want to come to that. But guess what? In me, there's no good thing. 
And I had to come to a place of no hope. I had to finish out the course and come to the place of no hope. And when I did, I was surprised because no hope looked like the cross to me. <laughs> total annihilation of Randy, total, I mean, I would just be blob city. I don't know what I thought. These are kind of some of the thoughts I remember. You know, I'll just be, you know, I'll never, I'll never, I don't even know. I don't, there's so much that, I, you know, because you don't know. And I remember coming to that place of utter hopelessness, no hope, death, the, the need for death, for something that is that wretched, and, and just going, like, I don't know how to put it, it's, it's just a picture, it's not the way, it, none of this has probably happened to you this way, but it's like, it was like finally laying my arms up on the cross and going, kill me, I deserve to die. I don't, this don't ever need to be touching anybody again. And that's really the way I feel. This is so yucky and so not Jesus. Kill me. I mean, that's the only way. Now, I know that's just a picture. But that was, I just went, God. Uh, and, you know, and I was ready for the cross. I mean, I was just going, man, now I can see the value of the cross. Get rid of this. You know, but at the same time, there was tremendous remorse and whatever because I had realized that I had not only just failed, I was a complete failure, completely not what God wanted. And I wanted so much to be what God wanted. And I've said this before, only a few of you probably remember it, but something wonderful happened. <laughs> I, as it were, left across me. I submitted as it were. I, the only way I know how to put it. It's just words. of truth that you may see another way. But I said yes to the cross. I mean, you can say it a bunch of ways. I got on it and said I'm ready to die. I need to die. I'm for the good of everybody. Let's do it. And it was like three days of just this reality of no hope and of utter need for death and walking in agreement with man, yes, the cross. You know, the cross, the cross, the cross. Go ahead. And I forgot that there's a resurrection on the other side. I totally forgot. I totally forgot. I, it was just like, because the resurrection when it began to happen, which was Christ in me, was not what I was expecting or had been looking for while I had been searching the scriptures. I don't know what I was looking for, but I wasn't looking for Christ to be my life and to start coming, to, you know what I mean, to actually see my God. And the Holy Spirit showed me that when Jesus died on that cross, Randy died. That when he died, I died. And now, through Romans 7, I understood why I died. It wasn't just some sort of theology. Man, I needed to die. And I could embrace the cross for the real reason, not just the truth that, well, I died with Jesus, but, you know, I'm a pretty good person and I've got lots of skills. Do you see what I mean? I mean, that is totally voiding out the cross while saying I believe the cross. It really is. It really is. I mean, it's... It's kind of agreeing to the fact of the cross while not going up there and getting on it and dying. You know. But the real spirit of it, the real thing that made it real from then on and has been, and nothing, now I can tell you this, 25 years or 24, because it was about my first year following the Lord that the Lord opened my eyes to this, Nothing has ever shook me from the reality that I died with Christ and he is my life. Nothing. Ever. Now, I've been shook on a lot of things, but I've never been shook from that because that truth is not in me. That truth is in the eternal annals of God that have been settled and written in the word of God. And Jesus settled that baby. <laughs> and I saw it. 
I saw it by the veil being raised. I saw it by the Holy Spirit, however word you want to put. But I saw it, and I saw why I had to die. And I saw that my nature was just the same nature everybody else had and that everybody else needed to die and that as long as we kept forming churches with people with a nature that was that wretched, we were in big trouble and that somebody needed to stand up and begin to preach the cross. Anybody see that? Somebody had to stand up and go, you need to die. But when you preach that, people go, yeah, yeah, I was kind of snotty today. I need to die to myself. Oh, man, that is so far away. That's like, that's like stubbing your toe up here early. You know what I mean? That isn't even entering these depths yet. You know? And, you, and so they go, okay, well, okay. You, you said it, and I can see the scripture says, you know, that, uh, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. So, amen. Oh, God, that ain't, that ain't the cross, that ain't the reality, that ain't the entering into, that ain't the fullness of And there's no strength or conviction or faith that comes out of that sort of a apprehension of the cross. There isn't. You can't. There's no way that anything... The only way is to have dun, 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 and then walk... And, and I remember as I walked that last mile to, to be put in an electric chair... <laughs> It was like I was holding on to a rope and it was greased and I was about to let go. And I, was use, I had used all my strength and with early on, way up the rope, when I had some strength, I was really holding on. I mean, really, with all the stuff Randy's got and was slipping. And now I was back, I was down to the last little bit and I had no strength because I had been trying to hold on so hard for so long that I just didn't have any. And I was brokenhearted for God because I thought he was going to be so sad over me. <laughs> I mean, I did. I thought he was going to be so sad. I really, when I saved you, I had big hopes for you. And now look at you. This is really, I mean, these are the thoughts that are going through my mind, man. I mean, you know. You would have been, you and Kenneth Copeland would have been like that, and you know, all this stuff, you know, and, you know, but no, look at you now, you've come, these are the thoughts that I think God is thinking about, and I'm, and I'm broken hearted, I'm thinking God is broken hearted, I'm thinking, and I know, there's no question in my mind that it's just a matter of just a short time that I'm going to have to let go, I'm going to have, because I don't have anything left to offer. And it finally, that time came, and I let go. And that's when I, that was my, I guess, one of my first big revelations of what we call the arms of grace. That he caught me. And, and, but not instantly, because I fell for three days and three nights, you know, as it were. And it may not be three 24 hour days, you know what I'm saying. But, you know, I was in that tomb, I was dead. And I accepted the death. But then when the resurrection started happening, I couldn't believe it. I was, I was so, I felt like dumb and dumber, you know what I mean? I went, I should have not, I, the resurrection. I mean, I had so embraced death that, the, that, that I had, and I had so seen the need for death for me that I I couldn't even imagine the resurrection I, w I surely believed that what Christianity was going to be about was that this thing this horrible slimy useless yucky perverting messing up people's lives thing was just going to have to walk around and not touch anything and not do anything and because you recognize how slimy you are, and this is what the cross was. That was my, honestly, that was my embracing of the cross was, okay, I'll never touch or do or anything because I'm just yuck. <laughs> you know? Well, that was part of the thing that I needed to see. But then, when I don't have any more strength, and I've embraced death, and I said yes to the cross, I need to die, he goes, okay. You're dead. You died with me. And he shows me that. And he shows me that now Christ is my life and that that slimy, yucky thing 
died with him on the cross. That death is not the recognition of how slimy, yucky, and worthless I am. That's not the death of the cross. That's the realization of the facts. That the death of the cross is that he took that slimy, yucky thing. Now you got somebody that only glories in the cross. Remember Paul said that? God forbid thy glory anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom I am crucified under the world. <laughs> you know, they don't need any more of this. You know, you don't get none of that Nicodemus. Oh, what, I'll go in and come out again? You know, when he, when, you know, you send Nicodemus through this, he goes, no way, I ain't going in and coming out again. You ain't getting another of me. You're not getting a second time. You're not getting... I need death. And the cross is the most beautiful thing. It's, you, you, it's funny, but the, the nature of Jesus begins to be worked in you and you don't even know it. Because you start thinking, like, man, you know, the best thing for everybody is not this. You know, and that's the Lord. He's protecting his people. But we don't recognize it because we think, see, but we go, man, and, you know, but see, I even hesitate to tell you some of this stuff because the flesh will latch onto that and go, well, praise God, well, then I, I've been going with the Lord. And then you've just circumvented it and you're going to have to go bigger hog pen, you know, and bigger ones, you know what I mean? I mean, we got some big ones, you know. So, you know, and like I said, all the examples and everything, but I've, I've told you exactly the process I went through. And when I did, the resurrection began to be coming back to the Father by Christ. Now, when there is no hope in you and you've really seen it, then the cross is presented to you and you embrace it and you go, yes, yes, this gets rid of all of it. Yes, yes, yes. And you embrace it and you go, oh, I love it. I love the cross. <laughs> you know, and then, then he reveals the Son in you, resurrection, he reveals the Son in you, then you realize that you have a relationship with the Father by Christ, and you don't mix the two, this slimy thing that died over here, and this glorious, beautiful, self-giving thing that is Christ. You don't get it mixed up, or you don't say you're Jesus when it's your flesh, or it, it is Jesus, and you claim the glory for it. You know what I mean? You don't mix all them through this process. Before you come to this, you'll do a lot of that. But when you go through this process, there will always, for all eternity, indelibly be sealed in your mind what you are and what he is. And when people try to get you off or when you preach under any circumstances dealing with any subject, you will never slip up. Because you, it's settled. Nah. You know, anybody starts pointing to this and trying to pump it up or make it, you go, leave it alone, it's dead. You know what I mean? And I've embraced that, and I'm happy about it. So don't you come trying to resurrect my flesh. Here, he is the resurrection and the life, and this is my everything. This is my all in all. This is my hope. This is my peace. This is, he is all of that, and I'm in him. So don't you go trying to do anything with this old thing because I will not yield to it. And I will not be deceived. I will not be suckered. I will not secretly sneak over here and try to pull the spikes out and get him off, off the cross so that he can... No, I'll never do that. And I know that I'll never do that because I've seen... I've been through Romans. I've seen the depths. And I don't like what I saw, and I don't like it so much... So much. I, no words can say the real meaning of I know it so much. And when you get to so much, the next step is you will be willing to embrace the cross. Only then. I mean, the way God wants it. I don't mean the theology and all the things you've heard. You forget all that, because that ain't going to... That'll just be your theology, and it'll never have life, and it'll never produce Christ, and it'll never, it'll always be, it'll always fall short, and it always does fall short, because until the cross has truly eradicated you and I, there ain't no resurrection until there's a death, and he is the resurrection. Until we die, there ain't going to be no resurrection life. Oh, there'll be the Holy Spirit that'll help you, won't there? He'll help you along, 
but he'll be helping this old flesh. You know what I mean? He'll be helping your flesh get up just to keep it going so that maybe one day it can recognize its depths so that you will one day truly embrace the cross so that when you truly embrace the cross, the Father steps forward. For the first time, this has been the Holy Spirit working in your circumstances, working to show you when you want to do good, you can't. This is the Holy Spirit working in your linear, man. He's faithful. He's sitting down here. Remember, he ain't up there. The Holy Spirit came down here. He's right there. He's messing. He's working. He's trying to show you all this stuff and everything. And he's working. But then the Son comes into play when you embrace the cross because you don't get to the cross by the Holy Spirit. You get to the cross by Jesus going there. And now the, the Holy Spirit has done his work. And then the Son does his work because you embrace the cross. But you can't get to the cross. You can't kill that old yucky flesh. You can't kill it. And, and you have tried that. Part of the wretchedness of this process is you've tried pretty doggone hard to kill it, and you haven't been able to, and that's when, when the Holy Spirit presents going to the cross in Christ as a reality, you grab it. So now you're in fellowship with the Son, and you're in the Son, and you embrace this union. First of all, you are joined to Him not in resurrection but in death. Know ye not? that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death, and that death was so that the old man might be crucified. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified, see, by Christ, okay? So now you're in union with Christ. First was the Holy Spirit's it. Now it's the Son and Christ and Him crucified, and this becomes everything. But once that truly, truly becomes established, now the Son comes to the Father, the Son. And folks, who else got up from that cross but Jesus? Nobody, except us in Him. Now we did, but not us. Not I, but Christ. Those aren't just words. That's not just scriptures that we quote. It's not, the, uh, it's not new creation theology. It, new creation theology ain't worth the thimble you could shove the scriptures in. It ain't worth nothing. But the truth is worth everything, and it fills everything, and all these shadows and stuff is ridiculous. It's, this isn't life, nor is it living, nor does it have anything that could bring. Once you've entered into this, and by Christ you're a son of God, and you know, and you, the separation of you and him is clear by the cross, then you relate. You don't have a hard time identifying yourself in Christ and then slipping back and being an individual identity and then, you know, going, oh, what am I doing? I should have, oh, oh darn, and go back over here and get into him and go, okay, I'm one with Jesus, so whew, I was working real hard over here as an individual identity, uh, uh, entity to get uh, acceptance, and that's stupid. I got off from the truth, but now I'm in Christ, and now I know I'm accepted. Well, that's true, and you are, and if you hold that, you'll be doing good, but the truth is, you won't hold that. You, you'll slip again, and you'll go back, and then you'll slip again, and you'll go back, and then you'll slip again. And you know what? That what will be what you think is Christianity. But if you have gone this route, then by the time you get here, there is no, you don't slip. You don't, I don't slip. Now, I'll tell you what. I, I'm growing in the reality that there are things that I have not yet understood in relationship to things about me and things about Christ. But in relationship to that which I know, I don't slip. I have in Christ. You don't ever find me. I don't care how down I am. You don't ever find me going, well, oh, if I could just please God. <laughs> you don't ever find You know what I mean? Or, or if God would just accept me. You never find me saying I know where my acceptance is. I may not accept me. But when I look at the Father, I know I'm accepted in the beloved. And that is settled, and I don't ever, ever, ever get shook. Why? Why? That's not just because, Randy, you're a special person. Don't think you're the pastor. I'm telling you, I saw this years and years, 13, 14 years before I was ever a pastor. And God didn't teach me these things because I'd be a pastor to teach them to you. He did not. I'll tell you why he taught him. He taught him to me because he's my father and he wanted to bring his son into that and you're his son too and he wants to bring you into that and that's what it's A-L-L -L about. That has nothing to do with pastoring all this stuff. And that's why you get to teach it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm serious. I know that that's not what it's all about. But this 
falling in and out of Christ and identifying and then being independent and then identifying and then independent. You can, you can pretty much expect a lifetime of that until you have come this route. Once you come this route, man, you will so, you will never look to that leper that was you to go around doing help, giving a helping hand to people. How about that example? You'll never look to that slimy leper whose skin is falling off from the disease eating him alive and, and, you know, and go, oh, can I give you a helping hand, you know? And everybody, you know, go, I don't think so. Just, you just better be thankful that others don't see you the way you really are apart from Christ because they would run a billion miles. However, that's just the truth apart from Christ, but you're not apart from Christ. You're one with Christ. But you've heard me say that a million times. But that has no power outside of the distance I share it and the Holy Spirit falls on you because you leave here and it leaves you sooner or later again. And you have to hear it again, get pumped up, but there is a time and a place where that's not supposed to happen anymore. Where you know it, that you're identified here because everything else that was you has been identified as the ultimate yuck. And you have embraced the cross and you will never ever release it. The cross is, is like a, you know, you are like some sort of horrible cosmic evil and the cross is like some sort of glorious cage that you have been put in and then put away with <laughs> and you will never release it again ever you know if you're the son of God come down from the cross I don't think so number one the son would say no this is for the father and I ain't going to Get, I ain't going to free my flesh and save, save myself. But he also says, are you kidding me? We finally got all of the sin nature, all of Adam in me, and we're fixing to do away with it. Are you kidding me? No way. I ain't coming down from the cross. I'm staying. Well, pretty soon you are joined with Jesus up there, and you don't just go, well, whatever he says. You go, yes, I'm in agreement with him. He and I are one. No way that we are coming down from the cross. You don't just pull up scriptures from 2,000 years ago and go, I identify with that, I believe that. You know what I mean? I mean, you are with him now in that reality. And things and people and whatever appeal to your flesh and whatever, but you have seen the depths of your flesh and you go, no way. No. No. See? So if there's any question in your mind, have you come there? Uh... The Holy Spirit will confirm that one way or the other by the truth. This truth brings you to this truth. This truth brings you to this. This truth requires the constant, vigilant work of the Holy Spirit as you search the Scriptures, because there is a connection of the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it is that contrast, most of the time, of that nature of Jesus that makes you see how really bad you are. Now, that's really the truth. I mean, if you're not seeing, if you don't have a contrast, you'll compare yourself to somebody else and go, well, I'm not so bad. You'll never see the truth until you see how really beautiful Christ is. So he begins to show that. But he shows that wretchedness. Then you embrace the cross. This is a union with the Holy Spirit. I mean, with the Son. Now, the Son has become preeminent. And then ultimately, as the Son, now the Spirit of His Son comes into your heart and you cry, Abba, Father. Now your words are no longer, oh, Jesus, Jesus, I love you, I love you. You're everything, you're precious. You know what I mean? That Jesus movement mentality kind of thing. You know, Jesus, you're my best friend. You're my pal. You're my, you know, I mean, he is your life. And you say, oh, Father. Really? Lots of hands up here. Ricky? <laughs> How do you? I love that. I always get that.
makes sense. Um, the Holy Spirit reveals Christ. The Father doesn't reveal Jesus. No, you said it right. You're right. Now let me explain. The Holy Spirit reveals the Son or reveals Jesus. The Father reveals the Son. The Son reveals the Father. It's a difference. There's a difference between the Holy Spirit who reveals Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the Son who reveals the Father. You can't know... You know, I mean, I could sit here and say I'm a father, and if I didn't have any children, I mean, it's my children that really reveal I'm a father, not the fact that I say I'm a father. Right? Only the son can reveal the father, and, o and this father-son relationship can only be revealed between these two. But to have the son in, in you <laughs> takes the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ, who... Once you begin to understand he's Christ, the Savior, the Lord, the da 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 da, the one who went to the cross, <gasps> resurrection, the the logos of God called the Son, the Son reveals it's a Father that's God. Oh! Anybody catch that? Well, you got it. That's all that's important because you asked the question. I mean, there. I don't, I don't know how to explain it anymore. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus, but he doesn't reveal the Son. The Son is a father-son relationship. Only these two can reveal one another in the relationship of father and son. But the Holy Spirit can reveal Christ, and Jesus said when he comes, he will speak of me. He'll not speak of himself. He reveal things concerning me. Okay. Well, but he didn't say as son and father relationship. You can't have a father-son relationship until the Christ who is the son. But in most cases, we don't even understand that. I mean, you can, I can tell you he's the son all day long, and you don't know what that means until the son is revealed in you, and you understand you're in the son and begin to relate to the father by the son. Roger? Right. That, what you just said right there is, is basically it because the Holy Spirit is going to reveal Christ and let's put it this way, Christ and Him crucified. Okay? So that, what that does is that takes you to the cross. That's this side of the cross. That's, that's union with Christ before the cross, union with Christ at the cross. Once He has come up and you no longer are, then who comes up? The Son, who now the Son begins to reveal the Father. Well, I would, uh, well, no, I think there's a truth to that, but it would be, now, I guess people do it, but it'd be real, I mean, if you, if you see, think of it, if you see the depth, the depth, the real fullness of the depth, I will never leave that, if you've really seen it, but if you just kind of seen it or whatever, you hadn't seen much at all, You'll go and you'll come back and God won't be as harsh with you. But imagine having seen the ultimate flesh and you come up with a key and open it up and let it off. You know, I always hesitate to share that because there's always somebody that comes to me that, especially after class like this, and goes, oh, my God, I've done it. I've committed the ultimate. And they're so far from it, it's ridiculous. So let me tell you, if you're going through that right now, it's probably not, you're not even close. You haven't had that much rev revelation. You're really not as spiritual as you think you are. And just keep going and God will reveal his son and you'll be fine. Okay? Uh-huh. Well, the truth is that it's not a hideous, horrible ordeal. I mean, it is, but it's, that's not the real issue. We are hideous and horrible. 
And that's a fact. The fall made us what we call uh, um, depraved. But we don't know that because we have formed a society and we do good things and we have the knowledge of good and evil. And we think, you know, it's kind of like Israel. They think they're in, they're in Egypt and they think, if I can just get these Egyptians out of here and Pharaoh from ruling over me, I would live for God and have a good life. So God delivers them, puts them out in the wilderness, and they murmur and complain the whole time. That's the purpose of the wilderness, to show them that we think our problem is Pharaoh, the bondage, the junk, the slave, you know, oh man, I could live for God if somebody just get this stuff off of me and everything. And God has to show us, not, not put us through a hideous ordeal, though it is, it is, but what he's, but, but it's, the hideous ordeal is not really the issue. The issue is we are way and that, that isn't even a close word, way worse than what we think we are. And I don't believe, I said this though, I don't believe we have to, I don't believe necessarily that you have to go to the depths because the point isn't necessarily to know the depths. The point is at some juncture to go, hey, I've seen enough, I don't want this for you, Lord, I love you too much, and this is too yucky for your kingdom to loose this in there. What do I do? And he points to the cross. And, I mean, I, honestly, I was, a year, what, a year and a half old in the Lord when God began to reveal this to me. I don't believe it has to take 20 years. I don't believe it has to take 40 years in the wilderness. I believe the, the journey from Egypt to the promised land is 11 days, and if you just get after it, you can make it. But, the trip's up to us, too, and see, and the deal is, is that there is, uh, and this is bad, but, you know, that's where your questions come from, but most of us don't know that we're as bad as what we are. Mount? Right. Which always makes it take longer. Right. And we get, we get the feeling from Paul that it, he was three years out in the wilderness and studying the Word and seeking the Lord, and then he came out of the wilderness and understood these things and began to share it. Um, I don't know that it has to be a big, long, bad ordeal. Now, for me, I mean, honestly, it was about, it was, it's almost like, it's, to me, the end result was the bringing forth of Christ. So it would almost be like saying, I don't know why you have to carry that stupid baby and labor and carry it around and then go through all this pain and stuff to bring it forth. And you go, well, actually, when it comes forth, you forget the pain for the joy that... But before that, we don't even see the joy. We don't have a clue about the joy because we're so concerned about the pain. <laughs> and that's the truth. Jerry?
I'll let you keep going on your second point, but I isn't it amazing grace that says that was a worm or something like that, you know, or such a wretch as I and all this kind of stuff. And I remember going, you know, why does it say that? I mean, I ain't so bad until God brought me to the re- And then I went, oh, okay, you know, now I understand and now I need Jesus. You know, we say we need Jesus, but if we don't understand the depth of, of our depravity, in what way do we need Jesus? We don't see the depth of our need. In what way do we need you? We only need him for a few spotty things in our life. And go ahead, because I know you have not Right. Or bad, it doesn't matter. Well, you consider the Apostle Paul. I mean, he said concerning the law, blameless, da 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 da. You look at his life before that. The man was not some sort of a drug addict or something, or, or rapist or whatever. He was he was as much as you could be without Christ, a godly man. But he began to see subtle, hidden yuckies that were infiltrating everything, and they weren't pure motives, and they weren't right things. They were selfish, or they were self-serving, or they were, you know what I'm saying? In contrast to Christ. Because, see, to me, if I had not been in the Word as strong as I was, and seen Christ and then gone out and done something or thought something or reacted a certain way, even if even if somebody came up and says, you know, would you sweep the floor? And I go, you know, I may on the inside go, you jerk, you always ask me, I don't know whether, you know, people are, you know, and, but on the outside I may go, sure, praise the Lord, and be going like this, you know what I mean? And I did some stuff like that, you know, well, praise the Lord, you know, on the inside, you jerk, you know, but I can't act this way because everybody here would think I was unspiritual. You know, but that that didn't. Have, eventually, it didn't matter whether it was outside or inside or da 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 or whatever. Because when I got back in the Word and saw Jesus, and then I saw me as a contrast, it just that contrast made me go, "Oh, wretched man that I am." Amen. And a lot of people see that contrast, brother, and they don't want what they see in the Word more than the reactions they see in themselves. They go, you know, I can't live that, or or I don't want that. I'd, I've had, you know, I've had people say, I, you know, I want to be selfish. Leave me alone. And I've just gone, do you not see but then I don't say that. I just go, well, maybe they don't. I mean, I, you know, in reality, they couldn't see. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that they could truly see. It's hard for me to believe that you can look at Jesus and look at us and go, I want to be selfish. I mean, I don't know. I have a hard time. So I have to assume they really haven't seen yet, and so I don't get mad and go, well, you jerk, you crucify Jesus and rip him up with a knife. You know, I go, you, you ain't ripping up nothing because you ain't seen nothing. You know what I'm saying? Well, is that it? I mean, I said we wouldn't go long, and I lied. See, oh, wretched man that I am. Father, thank you for this time. We just ask your holy...